new friends who have come, Gwen, Eric, Arun, Prakash, Jamal, Ira. Glad to have you all here. We have some, some different surprise articles for you tonight, and I'm ready to begin, Katarina, if you are. Yep, ready. Sorry, I was sharing a little bit. I know, it's tricky. We have to navigate back to our mics. But um, OK, here we go. So new robotic surgery is transforming epilepsy treatment. And epilepsy is important to learn about because if it doesn't, um, if you don't have anyone with epilepsy in your life, in your circle of people you know, it is considered one of the invisible diseases that's extremely debilitating to people and prevents people from working and engaging in, in life in the way that um, you know, many of us are able to. So the article begins, more than 3 million Americans have epilepsy, a brain disorder that causes recurring unprovoked seizures. Many patients have experienced successful treatment with medication, but up to a third of epileptics are resistant to seizure medication. And now, medication-resistant seizures that might have been incurable several years ago are being treated with new surgical techniques using robotics. Dr. Alex Whiting, Director of Epilepsy Surgery for Allegheny Health Network, is using the new technology to help patients across southwestern Pennsylvania. The ROSA, or R-O-S-A, robot has allowed us to place electrodes into deeper parts of the brain in safer and more minimally invasive ways than ever before, Whiting explains. Each electrode incision is less than a few millimeters wide, small enough to close with a single stitch. We can place a significantly denser array of electrodes, which makes us much better at finding exactly where a patient's epilepsy is coming from. More importantly, because it is so minimally invasive, Patients can go home the day after we are done with the procedure and be essentially back to their normal selves immediately. That is astounding. I'm, I'm just thinking of friends that I know who have had surgery from epilepsy and, and it's months, it's months that, that people are in recovery. Okay, continuing. One patient who has benefited from this procedure is Silas Johnson of Oakmont. After developing epilepsy at age 19, Johnson started experiencing three to four seizures a week, was unable to leave home and needed constant care. His doctors tried various medications, but nothing seemed to help. Finally, he met Whiting, who performed the robotic mapping on Johnson's brain in October. Before we started the robot program, you couldn't do this in a minimally invasive way, Whiting says. Now we put these electrodes in with a robot and place them through little holes that you can barely see, and in Silas we found that his epilepsy was coming from a part of his brain that we could treat without causing harm. A year and a half after the procedure, Johnson is doing well and has not has had a seizure in four months. He's looking forward to taking his first vacation in years and going back to work. If it wasn't for Dr. Whiting, I'm telling you, I would not have known what other path to take, he says. How does it work? Every patient's epilepsy is different, and any part of the brain could be causing the seizures. For many patients with epilepsy, even extensive workups don't reveal which part of the brain is causing their seizures, which makes it very difficult to treat. And now, surgeons are using stereoencephal and electroencephalography, or SEEG for short, to map the brain. During the procedure, we place electrodes throughout parts of the brain where we think the patient's epilepsy might be starting and then watch the patient for several days in the epilepsy monitoring unit. When they have a seizure, we can see where it starts in the brain and where it spreads. Once we figure this out, we have a host of tools and treatments to target that part of the brain, sometimes curing their epilepsy for good. When we have enough information, we take electrodes out and patients can go home next day. Nothing stays in permanently. Whiting says that the SEG is just one tool in the toolbox to help treat epilepsy by understanding where it originates. Sometimes this involves surgical resection, laser ablation, or neurostimulation. All of them work very well for certain patients, but we have to know exactly where the seizures are starting in order to use them. Ultimately, the electrodes in SEG help us figure out which tool is the best to use for each patient. 
The program at AHN is relatively busy with doctors performing two to three procedures a month. Whiting said, with how safe and effective the SEG has become, he thinks it will become a much more commonplace treatment for medication-resistant epilepsy patients over the next few years. The new treatment is offering hope to patients whose quality of life has been impacted from the disorder. Having seizures is just tough on the brain, he adds. It's essentially an electrical storm taking over the entire brain. Having untreated seizures for a long period of time can cause permanent damage to the brain, which can affect mood, memory, and cognitive functioning. Patients with certain kinds of epilepsy are at high risk for traumatic falls, hitting their head, and other dangerous behaviors. Many patients' epilepsy prevents them from doing simple tasks such as holding a job, going for a walk alone, or driving a car, which can lead to anxiety, depression, and other health issues. Whiting sees the new procedures as a light at the end of the tunnel. I think the most important thing to know is that if you have epilepsy and have tried two or more medications and are still having seizures, the current medication is to have a surgical evaluation at a center like ours. There's so many new ways to treat epilepsy, and many of them minimally invasive, and that is certainly worthwhile to see if one of these new treatments can help. Thank you. Yeah, this is really amazing work um, of this group and various groups that are working on this to have this, you know, less and less invasive procedures and more and more precise for um, each patient. Um, it's really a game changer for so many people and also for other disorders. Um, you know, we've been before for decades treating people in very similar ways. Like if we thought, you know, the symptoms are this, then everyone has to have, you know, the underlying mechanism is most likely this for everyone. And we disregarded so many, such a high percentage of people where the treatments would just not work or would not work well enough. So, um, so that we kind of now are starting to consider, you know, a higher percentage of people where it doesn't work and, and, and develop treatments for them. That is already, you know, a huge step. And this is really wonderful that this is, you know, such minimally invasive. So yeah, it's, it's great news. Thank you, Victoria, for sharing. Yeah, sure. And I was I was reading there are other robotic treatments where there's a tiny, it's I think a um, few millimeters big device that's shaped like a just like a little cylinder, and then when it's inserted in through through a tiny hole in the skull, it opens up into a flower shape and applies pressure on specific parts of the brain that are necessary for you know, for that person's particular type of epilepsy that it can help control. And that some, some types are, are um, um, some epileptic seizures are stimulated by even weather patterns and temperature patterns. And, and as well, that even the surgery can affect people's ability to control their emotions or it can affect their long and short term memory. So there are so many things that we, you know, we don't know. We never know what people are suffering. So um, also, yes, this is, this is just fantastic news for something that must be so frightening when you don't ever know when a seizure is happening. And welcome, Dr. Shaw. It's great to see you. Hi, Victoria, Katerina, and everyone. So I'm ready for the next one, if you're ready to pin that. Oh, yeah, um, I'll put the next one up. Um, Dr. Shah, I know you just arrived, but you have um, amazingly fast powers of reading an article. So if you care to comment, please feel free. Sure, sure. This is the first time, actually, I'm just presenting in Science News. So let me see how can I handle it. All right, we're glad to have you. Yeah, it's wonderful. So uh, okay, hold. And I'm going to open this up as well. 
I wanted to make a comment also in general about this robotic arms uh, surgery in general. You know, there was, especially last week, a lot in the news about Neuralink finally getting human clinical trial approval. And, you know, a lot of people that don't know the field think that this is the only company that's developing robotic arms for surgery and minimal invasive. And I've been saying that's not true. You know, my brother, he's a neurosurgeon. They don't just, you know, go into a brain, you know, if they need to be very precise with their free arm, just, I don't know what type of people imagine how brain surgeries go, but, you know, a free floating arm from a human doesn't, you know, just go in and does something very precisely. There have been a lot of companies developing amazing tools. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to make people aware that, you know, for animal surgery or human surgery. There are a lot of really great companies doing really wonderful work like this and uh, developing these precise instruments. And they have been in use for a very long time and helping a lot of people for a very long time. So (laughs) just that everyone knows, thank you. Yeah, well, that's really great to follow up that article as well, because that that precise diagnostic is exactly what they were talking about. So they're not going in and poking around and trying to figure out where something's happening. So thank you. All right, next we move over to pollinators and and specifically weevils, long nosed beetles are unsung heroes of pollination. In a special kind of intertwined plant-pollinator relationship thought to be rare is present in hundreds of weevil species. Some of nature's most diverse pollinators often go unnoticed, even by science. Long-snouted beetles called weevils A new study provides a deep dive into the more than 600 species of weevils, including ones whose entire life cycles are interwoven with the specific plant that they help pollinate. Butterflies, bees, and even bats are celebrated as pollinators, creatures that travel from flower to flower to feed and in the process help fertilize plants by spreading pollen. But some of nature's most diverse pollinators, as was mentioned, often go unnoticed, and in a new study, in the journal Peer Community and Ecology, provides a deep dive into the more than 600 species of weevils who are now found to be pollinating. Even people who work on pollination don't usually consider weevils as one of the main pollinators, and people who work on weevils don't usually consider pollination as something relevant to the group, says Bruno de Madeiros, an assistant curator of insects at Chicago's Field Museum and the senior authority of the study. There are lots of important things that people are missing because of preconceptions. I think that's one of the best statements in the whole article, because I'm sure if if any indigenous population was interviewed and, and asked the question, who are your pollinators that you've noticed, that it would be rather a diverse, um, it would be a diverse um, collection of both insects and and animals as well. So continuing. There are about 400,000 species of beetles that scientists have identified, making them the largest group of animals in the world. And the largest group of beetles are weevils. There are 60,000 species of weevils we know about, which is about the same number of all vertebrate animals put together, says De Madieros. The new study is a review of hundreds of previously published descriptions of interactions between weevils and plants to better understand their role as pollinators. Weevils are sometimes considered pests, and they can sometimes be found in pantries, eating pasta and grains, and around the turn of the 20th century, boll weevils disrupted the American South's cotton economy by feeding on cotton buds. However, many species are beneficial to plants, especially as pollinators. In this study, we focused on brood site pollinators, which are insects that use the same plants that they pollinate as breeding sites for their larvae, says De Madieros. It is a special kind of pollination interaction because it is usually associated with high specialization. 
because the insects spend their whole life cycle in a plant, they can only, uh, only pollinate that particular plant. And because the plants have very reliable pollinators, they mostly use those pollinators. Brood site pollination is a little like a more extreme version of the relationship between monarch butterflies and milkweed, which is the only plant monarch, butter, monarch caterpillars eat and the site where the butterflies lay their eggs. But brood site pollinators, unlike monarchs, take the relationship a step further. Adult monarchs feed on the nectar of many different flowers, but brood site pollinators, including many species of weevils, rely on only their one plant partner as a source of food and a site for egg laying. This kind of pollination interaction is generally thought to be rare or unusual, says De Medeiros. In this study, we show that there are hundreds of weevil species and plants for which this has been documented already, and many, many more yet to be discovered. These closely linked relationships mean that the plants and weevils need each other to flourish. Oil palm, which is used to make peanut butter and Nutella, that's interesting. That's if you if you choose um, an easy spread peanut butter. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just peanuts. Okay, oil palm, which is used to make peanut butter and Nutella, um, was not a viable industry until someone figured out that the weevils found with them were their pollinators. That's amazing, says De Medeiros. And because people had an incorrect preconception that weevils were not pollinators, it took much, much longer than it could have taken. He says that these sorts of misconceptions are one of the motivations for the new study. We're highlighting a group of insects that most people want to see killed, and we're showing that they can actually be pretty important for maintaining ecosystems and products that we care about, he says. We hope that by summarizing what we know and providing some pointers on what we should be paying attention to, we can help other researchers and the public to better appreciate the role of weevils as pollinators, especially in the tropics. Thank you. Open for comments, friends. Yeah, this is a great article. And um, I think even these crawling animals are evolutionarily first to pollinate. Um, I think like, you know, a more conserved or older evolutionary species, plants and flowers, uh, they rely more on these crawling pollinators. And only later on, I think, came the, the ones that rely on like flying um, insects and, and, and so on. So uh, I always thought that, uh, you know, this very sad truth that, um, you know, bees are dying, especially in Europe and the Americas. There are other bee types uh, from Asia that are not so, they are still in trouble, but to some parasites, they are not so, um, they, they have a better defense mechanism. But anyways, in case this keeps going on, I always thought, you know, if you really rely on this, for crops or fruits and so on to maybe um, genetically engineer the flowers that they would attract also these crawling pollinators or this other type of pollinators. So this would be very sad if you would have to do it, but um, it's really important to know this whole ecosystem. So we, you know, consider before killing some insects that they have a role to play and if we erase them by accident or on purpose um, you know a lot of things that we need and like also go away so <laughs> thank you for sharing that this is really important work yeah eric, thank you and oh sorry was that um somebody dr shaw were you in miking or uh eric raises and i i just invited yeah. him in but yeah go ahead yeah, hello eric welcome yeah hey i just wanted to share um I grow orchids. It's my hobby, and um, the 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 re there. It's insane how many different uh, relationships there are with insects and orchids. One uh, big group in particular is called bulbo bulbophyllums, and they they're some of them smell like feces, 
because that's their their flies or their pollinator often right so and others are rotting flesh and the rotting flesh ones are super cool because they're red and they have little white dots in them and when the wind blows they sort of move like little like maggots in in rotting flesh and it's they're stupendous looking flowers and you can grow them in your in vivariums and stuff there's a lot of people who who grow them they they're really fun i have like 50 different species of them but yeah it's 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 a lot of fun just uh you know it's truly amazing the relationships and beetles i'm sure are in many orchids too because you know orchids are just one of those more recent on the evolutionary uh spectrum so they've they've sort of evolved in such a way that they just form you know they can be highly variable in both their ecosystem and their pollinators and and such but a lot of times they are very specific too so i just want to share that with you that was a fun uh fun thing hearing about beetles where where do you live eric where do you grow all these plants oh in i'm in uh san francisco bay area i have a greenhouse ah okay okay now i understand because i was yeah yeah. oh my god i bought today a fig tree that is supposed to survive the new york city winter i'm very hopeful it has a lot of like figs tiny figs so and i bought a bunch of other plants let's let's see if that's true but um, all right do you want the fig wasp (laughs) Uh, try some try mulberries mulberries are really easy to grow and they're phenomenal plants the pakistani mulberry and persian mulberry are insanely delicious and they can handle cold weather in the winter oh thank you yeah yeah but you have a we are fortunate to have a backyard here in brooklyn so i'm planting different things like this is the second year we live here and i'm trying to plant flowers that are good for insects like for different type of insects but then also a few fruits that we like so (laughs) that's a good idea mulberries oh my gosh mulberry is so delicious and it's that's one of the most just beloved childhood trees to hang out underneath I don't know if anybody here has done that, but they just, they, their branches grow over and just drape down and form a kind of a, this cascading tent. So you can just sit under there and then eat and hide. <laughs> They're so fun. But Katarina, do you know that um, something like 95% of figs are pollinated by the little bitty fig wasp? So I, I don't know, you know, oh. what you need. Yeah, yeah. So every, I think that means that every wa- every fig, 95% of all the figs that we eat, we're, we're eating the remains of a little fig larvae. <laughs> Interesting. No, I didn't know. In Portugal, you know, we have yeah. a lot of figs. And my great-grandmother, she would eat them all day long. Like, she would love them in the fall. So, yeah, I really hope it will grow. And then... I also leave some of the weeds out. We have like a bunch of, they're pretty flowers too. And we actually have fireflies in the summer here in the middle of the city. I think Victoria, I showed you last year, like a few fireflies. So I hope they'll come back this this year. It should be soon, June. Oh, they will. That's right. You have a magical yard. Since you get fireflies, you'll, you can grow whatever. But it is, you mentioned, um, you know, just leaving the leaves and people are so, people feel, and there's also pressure from neighbors to, to clean up to deadhead plants and clean up old um, stems on, on flowering plants and, and rake up fallen leaves. But those are habitat and overwintering places. And not to mention that then they harbor things that, that birds eat. So the more you can leave and not rake up and not tidy up, the better it is for everybody growing. Yeah, yeah. we actually have a corner. So we have their squirrels and then we have a woodpecker and different birds that come in that corner where there's a tree. I leave the leaves. Uh, so for like Brooklyn, Williamsburg, we have kind of an ecosystem. Hi, Carlos. How are you? Did you want to say something? Sorry for going on. No, no, not not a problem. I'm just enjoying uh, the, the, the talk. 
I'm very much into insects. I have a little greenhouse and uh, I, I had a question. I also had a question for Eric and a question for anybody else in the room. I'm not a gardener. I've, uh, I'm so, a self-taught gardener. Uh, I, you know, I took biology in college like everybody, but I ended up growing fish, plants, and mushrooms. So I, I went from electronics. I mean, I still, I'm still electrical engineer. I'm a patent attorney, but um, it turns out that my passion is in biology, uh, and specifically uh, the integration of of plants, fish, and mushrooms in a symbiotic uh, sort of relationship. And I had a question for Eric, and also for any of you guys that actually have a biology background, because I don't. Um, for Eric, uh, I have a greenhouse, but but uh, what kind of conditions would I need in order to grow orchids? Is it like a, a I imagine it's humid, or or maybe you can tell me uh, what conditions I would need. And second question to anybody in the room: um, I've got a tomato plant that popped out of my compost before I could put a seed in there. A, a little tomato plant popped out, you know, in the compost soil that I was using. And of course, I compost my vegetables. So, you know, it probably came from a tomato that we were eating. Um, and it's been fruiting like crazy and producing, you know, all, all every single flower is producing a, um, a tomato. So second question. So first question, how do I grow orchids? Uh, second question, how are my tomato plants getting pollinated? I do have bugs everywhere, by the way. It's an open greenhouse, so there's all sorts of critters uh, crawling through it. And that's my question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Carlos, yeah, uh, just uh, orchids come from many different places in the world. Um, I grow, they, they like humidity. That's the one thing they do like. Um, but, uh, in in the San Francisco Bay Area, I grow a ton of orchids outside where it gets down to uh, the 40s um, in the winter. Uh, like if you envision the Himalayas, it's hot and wet in the summer, it's monsoons, but in the winter, it could get really cold. So you can certainly grow a lot, but you just need to sort of understand which ones you're growing because not all of them will do that. But so you can grow a ton. A ton of things and by the way as far as uh tomatoes go i've seen that in potting mixes tomatoes just sort of pop up and i think what happens you know it, it i think sometimes when people say they compost and do things like that they're not really doing it a hundred percent because certain seeds will make it through so that also implies maybe that pathogens can make it through too so i'm i'm always a little you know if you if you have a big serious farm i would be cautious about compost getting compost from generic places but for just general purpose for your own house or something like that it's not that big a deal but yeah the tomatoes are a trip they pop up all over the place the seeds and uh i i, I don't recall how they're pollinated they can be self-pollinated. Uh, wind and bees are pollinating them. So that's what's going on. I heard also you can put on a bee suit and an electric toothbrush and hand pollinate. That's a joke, yeah. but I, I have heard that actually. <laughs> but not about yeah, the bee well, suit. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I've done that with plants. I've just like touched the, you know, the stigma style, touch from one to another to another. Um, so yeah, you can, you can have at it, <laughs> cover them. Like I've covered things with a bag, shake the bag and then put the bag on the next thing. Like, um, for example, with, with, uh, summer squashes or winter squashes, I've done things like that. And like, I make a little buzzing sound and pretend I'm a bee. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> you know, I had heard that, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure the person wasn't joking. <laughs> that's, that's very cool. And, and um, you know, I never realized that you can cook uh, squash blossoms, uh, you know, fi uh, finely breaded uh, and fried, um, you know, super lightly breaded. Uh, my wife made some one time, and I was pleasantly surprised. The f they just tasted incredible, the flowers from uh, the squash. Well, I didn't know you could do that, but apparently you can eat anything. <laughs> yes, they're super edible. Um, I did, if it's okay, just want to add one more quick thing about pollinators and 
you know, we could call them unexpected pollinators or maybe better pollinators that we hadn't heard about yet is Scientific American just had published an article about a little frog in Brazil that is found to be pollinating, kind of like they were saying the brood specific pollinators, because this little frog eats, drinks the nectar and eats the fruit of this plant, which is, it's unusual that it's not a frog eating insects. So it's, it's wriggling into the flower of this plant and then it's drinking the nectar and then wiggling into another flower and sharing pollen, just, you know, like any pollinator would. But um, yeah, so there's, it's in this recent, it's milk fruit in Brazil, and it's a little tree frog that's, that's, um, that we can now thank for also joining the pollinators that we know about. Are, are you a, a, um, a pollinator expert? Or, I don't know if that's the right question. Uh, um, I also have black soldier flies in my greenhouse, and I don't know if they're pollinators. I I think they can just drink and have sex. I think that's their whole. Um, you know, they can drink water and then they mate, and that's it. And the larvae, I think, are the supposedly like the 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 most efficient composters on Earth, or something crazy like that. Um, but I don't know if you know yeah, about. I've seen those things, those big flat accordion like those are yes the, oh. the, the larvae the larvae wow. they you know the larvae look um they don't look like fly larvae which i think look disgusting no disrespect to fly larvae but the the black soldier fly larvae are kind of flat and they have these little um, um i want to say like scales like ridges you know they're they're they have a segmentation along their entire body and it's really incredible because they will crawl out of any container up to a 45 degree angle so they're self-harvesting uh and they're something like 33 percent protein 23 percent fat they have uh they have uh omega-3 fatty acids etc and you know i've been using them i i, I was using this fish feed where they would you know self-harvest into the fish tank <laughs> and and of course uh, uh some of the some of them would make it out to be a fly and they would come back and then um start the process all over again but they take something like a hundred a hundred pounds of compost and convert it to five pounds of larvae and I, I forget the exact numbers but it's it's just incredible how much they can uh you know they can compost and then the they the output from them can be given to to wor worms because uh the black soldier flies can't process cellulose and and actually when you combine the black soldier flies with the worms you get sort of like composting squared you know where it, it just goes super super fast uh so i've been doing that and then i use the soil uh in my in my greenhouse uh for uh, I, i'm doing soil-based aquaponics it's called dual root zone you know where you have uh you have um the, basically a planter inside of a flood and drain grow bed so that it's constantly getting fish pond water, but it's growing in soil. And it's really nice because the plants, uh, you know, do so much better. Uh, this year, for example, my tomato plants are flowering like crazy, where typically with aquaponics, you have a, you have a difficult time uh, with fruiting, um, you know, fruiting plants. That's why they mostly grow lettuce and stuff like that. But but it's nice that you now with when you in, in, include soil into the mix, you can grow fruit trees. And I've grown mulberry, I've grown moringa, banana trees, you know, pretty much everything. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm into uh, just as a hobby. And now it's starting to become um, a passion project. So thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing information about what you love and yeah those flies are juicy those are the larvae are so they really to me they look like big juicy black um sort of matte accordions and but they are lovely to have in the compost there's no odor when they're present there are just tons of them and i think it's a lucky day when they show up um i did google their pollinators um i don't know what they pollinate but they do and i'm i'm um, they are pollinators wow yeah so right uh dr shaw did you did you no uh 
That was very interesting. I'm just <laughs> learning too many things from different perspective. So this is important because when we are talking about the bees, for example, we, we know that from the, I mean, medical or biology perspective, we don't have that much pathogen in common with the bees. So they are pretty much safe. And uh, But when you just talked about the frog, <laughs> it just came to my mind about the different type of frogs and you might just heard about the hallucin hallucinogenic frog, if I'm right. I don't know. Did you hear about that? That was very interesting to me that you just mentioned about the pollination and the process. But however, always we should be careful, especially about the salmonella, because there's always a possibility. And um, I, I think that that's very nice that if we can get the precautions for those kind of things before using any kind of, for example, type of honey or those kind of things, try to buying, if you want to buy, buy it from the local area or the people that you know them very well. That's all I can say. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you for invo- Oh, go ahead, Carlos. No, no, ahead. no I, I was going to say the, yeah, there's the frog uh, that produces, I think it's, MEO5 DMT, um, it secretes it from its um, skin. And yeah, it's, it's highly hallucinogenic, apparently. That was mentioned in the article that it was unknown what the effect of, if there were um, the toxins in the skin from the frog, what effect that might have on the plants that it's pollinating as well. That was kind of minus for me, you know. You said frog. The first things came to my mind in the set of pollination, which is a positive thing. <laughs> I just doubt about it. Well, DMT can be a positive thing too. We won't talk about that, but <laughs> that, that's a whole nother room. <laughs> well, anyway, that's what we do, right? Um, we mention one thing and then it expands and explodes into all different directions. That's why we're here. That's why we love science. That's why we have fun. Do, do you mind if I, I ask you guys your background? I, I know I can look in your profile, which I probably should. Yeah, look in the profile. Um, <laughs> or, um, yeah, I'm, I'm an art and science teacher. I have okay. an um, environmental biology oh, nice. degree and, and dance as well. And I teach um, all different kinds of classes using the arts as the the integrative tool and um yeah and katarina is neuroscience and dr shaw um check out your very busy people yeah i i can um share the next link if you would like um I can only open the plant one. Yeah, that's perfect. I think the, that's, that's the other one. Something is wrong with the link. I cannot open it. So okay. I shared it in the chat, but something, I think something messed up with the copying maybe on WhatsApp. I don't know. It says it can't open it. So if you want to sh uh, share it, send me it to WhatsApp again, then, then we can go. But this one we can do first, and then in the meantime, if you want to resend me. Yeah, that. unless you want to get started with yours, considering where we are, that's all good. So, okay, so more, one more plant. I guess this, um, I guess we, we started with pollinators, which have to do with plants, and now something plant specific, which is plants, this article from Science News. Plants can distinguish when touch starts and stops, this study suggests. Even without nerves, plants can sense when something touches them and when it lets go, a Washington State University-led study has found. In a set of experiments, individual plant cells responded to the touch of a very fine glass rod by sending slow waves of calcium signals to other plant cells. And when that pressure was released, they sent much more rapid waves. While scientists have known that plants can respond to touch, this study shows that plant cells send different signals when touch is initiated and ended. It is quite surprising how finely sensitive plants are, plant cells are. 
that they can discriminate when something is touching them. They sense pressure and when it is released. They sense the drop in pressure, says Michael Knoblauch, a WSU biological sciences professor and senior author of the study in the journal Nature Plants. It's surprising that plants can do this in a very different way than animals, without nerve cells and at a really fine level. Knoblauch and his colleagues conducted a set of 84 experiments on 12 plants using tail cress and tobacco plants that had been specially bred to include calcium sensors, a relatively new technology. That's cool. After placing pieces of these plants under a microscope, they applied a slight touch to the individual plant cells with a micro cantilever, essentially a tiny glass rod about the size of a human hair. They saw many complex responses depending on the force and duration of the touch, but the difference between the touch and its removal was clear. Within 30 seconds of the applied touch to a cell, the researchers saw slow waves of calcium ions called cytostolic calcium traveling from that cell through the adjacent plant cells lasting about three to five minutes. Removal of the touch showed an almost instant set of more rapid waves that dissipated within a minute. The authors believe that these waves are likely due to the change in pressure inside the cell. Unlike animal cells with permanent membranes, plant cells also have strong cellular walls that cannot be easily breached, so just a slight touch will temporarily increase pressure in a plant cell. The researchers tested the pressure theory mechanically by inserting a tiny glass capillary pressure probe into a plant cell. Increasing and decreasing pressure inside the cell resulted in similar calcium waves elicited by the start and stop of a touch. Humans and animals sense touch through sensory cells. The mechanism in plant cells appears to be via this increase or decrease of the internal cell pressure, says Knoblauch, and it doesn't matter which cell it is. We humans may need nerve cells, but in plants, any cell on the surface can do this. Previous research has shown that when a pest, like a caterpillar, bites a plant leaf, it can initiate a plant's defensive responses, such as the release of chemicals that make the leaves less tasty or even toxic to the pest. An earlier study also revealed that brushing a plant triggers calcium waves that activate different genes. The current study was able to differentiate the calcium waves between touch and letting go, but exactly how the plant's genes respond to those signals remains to be seen. With new technologies, like the calcium sensors used in this study, scientists can start to untangle that mystery, Knobloch said. In future studies, we have to trigger the signal in a different way then has been done before to know what signal, if touch or letting go, triggers downstream events, he said. This study was supported by grants from the National Science Foundation. The international team included researchers from the Technical University of Denmark, Ludwig Maximilian Universität München and Westfälische Wilhelms Universität Münster in Germany and University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as WSU. Thank you. Yeah, that is so cool. Uh, I love this new plant study behavior or uh, field of, I don't know if we can already say cognition of plants, because, um, you know, the, the really big paper that came out, I think now over a little bit over 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, was from this group, from this woman scientist in Australia, I have to look her up, that showed that plants can have a conditioned memory. Um, and since then, it, there were a few labs in Switzerland before that did try to do this kind of research. But I think her publications really then um, drew a lot of interest into plants and you know, the plants uh, paper that came recently out that showed that they make noises when they kind of are suffering, uh, when they don't have water or, you know, kind of die, like, yeah, don't have water or something that uh, different types of plants make different type of, type of crying noises, like pop noises, popping noises. 
that was also really interesting that came recently out and yeah there's more and more plant and mushroom i don't know if you can say cognition but um yeah kind of like a cognition type of research is going on which is really interesting and not just it's it's also really helpful because i believe the sensors that can recognize these popping sounds um, which is in a frequency we cannot hear they are fairly cheap and um, it's a really good way of you know with with water resources in a lot of places being very uh, limited uh, you can basically have these centers on fields and distribute water when it's really needed and um, have this kind of uh, very efficient and also very, um, I don't know, plant human way of, of feeding and watering. So uh, I think that's really wonderful. And I was really thinking of one day putting these sensors here. I would love to to learn about the plants I have. And since I read this, I have to say I never leave a plant by itself like we have downstairs. We used to have, you know, I used to have like one plant there and one plant there, you know, in each room. I don't do that anymore. I have at least always two plants <laughs> next to each other uh, since I'm, you know, I read these kind of articles. So thank you for sharing. Well, that speaks to the cognitive nature of plants, definitely. And I'm going to do that too. I love that, that idea of not leaving them alone. I wanted to mention a few things that this this article brings to mind. Um, one is that just the idea that plants, that it's known that, um, you know, for example, we're talking about greenhouse, that if tomatoes are grown in a greenhouse compared with grown out in outside, and when that when plants are exposed to stressors such as wind, that they will have thicker stems. And so, and, and the same goes for trees, that wind, it's, it, it seems to help them strengthen their stems. Um, in addition, if anybody's ever uh, had the opportunity to play around with mimosa, you know, when you, it's the plant, it's a legume, and when you touch it, then those leaves close up. And, and also the way that when beans are growing, that the tendrils or peas, the tendrils will, will coil around something that's touching it and that's um thigmonetism i think it's called um but also the the idea of crown shyness that with with certain types of trees if you look up in the in the leaf crown that you can see that trees certain trees leave spaces for themselves and they're aware of each other, and you can see a like a delineated airspace in between the crown of certain trees. So there are so many examples that that we already know of that plants are, um, you know, are showing that they're sensitive to touch. Actually, that was that. a point came to my mind, Victoria, as well, because you just mentioned about the calcium and calcium signaling as we know that in the plants it it has a very important role and actually as a part of the changes in the plant we we should concentrate on calcium actually calcium concentration is very important and i think that it can be related to a stress response and how the plant make a different kind of protocol by themselves how they should act and adapt and in some of the cases, we see the escaping mechanism instead of resisting mechanism. That was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. In in terms of, um, yeah, what you both mentioned about the calcium, that is how with the mimosa, when it's, when it does, when the leaves do close, that it is, it is a calcium pump. It's a chloride potassium response and then a calcium pump that, that makes them, it affects the os, osmotic pressure somehow. It makes the cells shrink when they're touched and it, it all, it does have to do with this calcium pump. 
I, I think that uh, there is a gas sensor as well, as we know that. So, but I think that in this specific one, it might be related with the uh, kind of both stress response as well as the hormone signaling, as we see in the plants. But that's very interesting. Yeah, this is Richard. I wanted to make a comment. Um, <clears throat> I spent decades working overseas in Japan with technology exchange. And one of my primary vehicles was with a, uh, a medical researcher at Tokyo University. His name was Dr. Shozo Imezawa. And he had been part of the team. He, he's passed away now. He had been part of the team of the Japanese who had to recreate penicillin at Tokyo University from samples brought by the Germans during the war. They didn't have it. It wasn't discovered there. And certainly they couldn't get it from the allies. But the Germans had some and they had to had to back engineer and recreate it. In any case, he spent all of his life uh, working primarily in research in mycology. The, 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 the Japanese biological people are very, very involved in um, mushrooms and mushroom technologies. The East, it's, it's, it, it's just very much a part of their, their research. And he, he was focusing on um, certain kinds of mushrooms that were affecting cancer. And that's what he and I were working on. Um, he was ahead of his time. Um, and he pointed out to me in, in the course of my travels and communication with him, he said, Richard, did you know that of all the plants, the closest DNA structure to us are the mushrooms? I said, what? I said, well, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, of the DNA structure of mushrooms. And you could probably, Victoria, you could probably confirm this. I don't, it's, I'm not a botanist, so I have to back off being an expert, but he was very much into it. And he said, yes, by far and away, the closest plant relative to humans would be mushrooms. And they're not really plants. There's some other intermediary life form. But that was his statement. And I'm just leaving that and th including that information. Thank you. Yeah, I just did a quick Google <laughs> and I and I see computational Phylogenics comparing eukaryotes revealed that fungi are more closely related to us than to plants. Fungi and animals form a clade called Opistoconta, which is named after a single posterior flagellum present in their last common ancestor. Cool. I mean, they seem more closely related to us. They're they're living off of just the fact that they're they're sort of eating other plants it's always reminded me of what we do as omnivores that we eat other plants it's more than just live off them but it's it's i mean they do live off them but it it it, it just seems to me and their type of flesh has reminded me more of you know of, of muscle tissue for some reason so it's i just do feel akin to them more than to a tree that's that's thank you for bringing that up richard and welcome to the stage what's interesting with uh with mushrooms as well is of course they they exhale co2 so they're very much like we are in that respect and back to the tissue um question that you mentioned uh they can actually handle hydrogen peroxide uh just like uh, we can you know for for disinfectant which is interesting um, I, I, I believe they are, <laughs> I, well, you've confirmed that they are very close uh, to human DNA, but they're incredible, uh, incredible structures, you know, and then the communication uh, that they provide for the uh, plant and, and um, forest networks is incredible. I think my understanding is that mushrooms are the, the single biggest living organism or something like that. When you talk about mycelium. Perhaps I, I don't know, but I think that's what by I'm weight thinking. they outweigh everybody else, from what I understand. I, if you added all the mushrooms together, they outweigh all the other life forms, I, or something like that. They're just a tremendous number of them everywhere. So, but you don't notice them because they're kind of in the woods. And it's it's a huge life form. Um, my the mycology, my, well, the mycelium, sorry. yeah. Yeah, as you're saying, the mycelium that's under the ground, so we don't actually see that entire um, 
you know, biomass because it's it's that that doesn't mean it's not there. I and this is kind of asymmetrical what I'm about to say, but I, I'm intrigued by kind of medical or you know, what is it paleontological paleontological and organic and and biological oxymorons. One one interesting thing that I have come across recently is that there are sharks. There are there are progenitors of the current shark, who who existed in the oceans prior to the plants at all. So in other words, that actually sharks are, were here when there were no plants. I mean, some some primitive sharks, not the exact species that exist now, but the progenitors to those sharks that existed prior to the, the the emergence of plants on the surface of the oceans so that anyway it just it just intrigues me that there's the, the this animal that's here, that's here now that was here before the plants any of the plants I, anyway that's one of those oxymorons i'm just attracted to them i i shouldn't have brought it up but it just intrigues me thank you i'll leave it at that that is an idea that's welcome. All ideas are welcome here. This this stage is as much yours as it is ours. We're just here to share, initiate ideas, share ideas, and and yes, please share that information, share those things that interest you. Go ahead, Katarina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a really interesting discussion, and thank you, Richard, for sharing. And. Um, you will be happy to hear, as I said earlier, on June 5th at 7 p.m. EST, we'll have Dr. Fukasawa from Japan talking about mushrooms and the electrical potentials in fungus um, after rainfall, after rainfall event. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Richard. What time on June 5th? June 5th at 7 p.m. EST. Eastern time? Yes, mm -hmm, exactly. So three hours before now. <laughs> yeah, I, he will be for sure interesting to talk with. Wow, there, there, there's a, uh, I'm into mycology and, and um, there's some interesting experiments regarding uh, electricity and uh, pinning formation of fungi. <laughs> Apparently there's some correlation there, so that'll be very interesting to, to listen. Uh, what is his name, Dr. Fujiyama? Or... Uh, Dr. Fukasawa, and um, let me share the title of the paper and also the paper link in the chat. Then you can go ahead and look it up in the meantime. And yeah, we can ask questions. You know, it's very welcome to participate in the discussion, anyone who wants to. And I think it will be a really interesting discussion. So, there's the paper. I see one of the mic is on. Okay, yeah, I shared the paper also. So, yeah, he will presenting and then everyone is, of course, welcome to ask questions or ask him anything. <laughs> well, as long as it's about this work, so. Thank you. Um, that sounds great. I let me let me share this quick thing. Uh, the slime molds are particularly fascinating. They can travel uh, large distances. One time I went hiking when I was uh, young in in Half Moon Bay, and I came across a, a a gully along the river, along a creek that was just everything was black. The entire place was just, it was like a horror movie. And it was funny because I was with my girlfriend at the time and she was not really appreciating my, <laughs> I'm like, this is so cool. She's like, it's horrible, it's horrible. But it really was fascinating to see how that stuff had covered every branch and everything. It was totally a crazy stuff. So slime molds are something nobody talks about, but they're fascinating creatures too, or uh, organisms. <laughs> I like that. We may as well call them creatures. Make Grepley happy. <laughs> yeah, I was while we're while you're having this discussion a couple of minutes ago, I was thinking, hmm, we need to bring slime molds into this next week, perhaps. Thank you, Eric, for bringing that up. And of course, with that in mind, I'd like to mention the largest living organism on the planet, 
which is an aspen grove over many square thousands of square feet in on a mountainside in Colorado. By far and away, they're all connected to each other. It's an aspen grove, and they're all the roots are all connected, and it's many, many, many. I think hundreds, I don't know, of acres, and it's the largest living thing on on the planet that anybody has ever discovered. So, just throwing things that that attract me, which are like that. Well, you're in the right place because two weeks ago, Katarina shared a lovely article about that. Pando. Yeah, there was a team of um, musicians that kind of recorded these signals between them like and kind of kind of showed like they send different frequencies uh throughout the system and they could then um record it everywhere basically and this was one of the first signs that this is basically one organisms and uh yeah it's, it was a i think there's a non-profit also uh to kind of fund research around this huge organism and to protect it and so on. So yeah, it was a really interesting article um, that is, was it last week? Yeah, you said the week before, so two weeks ago. If you go in there, it should be in the chat if you scroll all the way through. Great, Um, yeah, this has been such a wonderful discussion. I love how, you know, it branches out into all these different um, places. So um, we can we can go into different directions um, more. Let's go into the world deadliest spider then, since we are, I have a bunch of human genetics and so on, but I think this fits kind of in the flow of today's discussion. It's funny that you mentioned that because I was just thinking right before you said that, I was thinking about the cordyceps mushrooms that are the ones that uh, are parasitic to uh, wasps and caterpillars and things like that and, and you know, grow inside of the body of, of, the, of the animal. And then you mentioned that. So I think we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> yeah, That's wonderful. Never <laughs> So, um, yeah, here this article says the world's deadliest spider can tweak its venom depending on its mood. So this very potent cocktail of toxins in the venom of one of the world's deadliest spiders seems to vary depending on context. A new analysis found how funnel web spiders produce their venom shows that factors such as spiders' heart rate and defensiveness could play a role in the proportions of chemicals delivered on the end of the fangs of an angry arachnid. Um, Why would we like to know it? Because funnel web spiders' venoms are complex mixtures with a um, range of potential applications such as natural pesticides, pharmaceuticals, not to mention the anti-venom used to treat spiders' deadliest, um, deadly bites. Understanding why funnel webs produce these mixtures could aid in more efficient venom milking and use and help us figure out the function of the venom. Funnel webs have the most complex venoms in the natural world and they are valued for the therapeutics and natural bioinsecticides that are potentially hidden in their venom molecules. Knowing more about how they are produced is a step towards unlocking this potential. They conducted a lot of research on this funnel web venom, uh, which is deadly only to the insect it preys upon and due to some weird quirk of evolution primates. Um, Australian funnel web spiders are famous for being the deadliest to humans anyway in the world. Although it may comfort you to know that although 30 to 40 people are bitten every year, only the male Sydney funnel web has killed people and there have been no funnel web deaths since an anti-venom was introduced in 1981. 
However, while a lot of work has been done to understand the molecular complexity of the venom, these studies have not considered the spider's behavior, physical state or environment, um, says Hernandez Duran and her colleagues. So they collected specimens of four species, um, the border ranges, um, Darling Down, Southern Tree Dwelling and Sydney funnel webs, and then they were uh, subjected to several annoying tests. These tests assess, ha, assessed huddling, defensive climbing, defensive climbing and general active behavior in three different contexts. The first was predation, which the scientists mimicked by blowing puffs of air or prodding the spiders with tweezers. The second was hanging out with another spider of the same species. And the third was the exploration of a new ter territory. During these tests, researchers mapped the behavior and measured their heart rate with laser monitor with a laser monitor to establish a proxy value for their metabolic rate. When then collected their venom and analyzed it with a mass spectrometer, they found for the three species that. Um, there seems to be association between their behavior and heart rate and the composition of their venom. Um, however, scientists noticed a difference for one spider, a higher heart rate and defensiveness in the border ranges full funnel web seem to be associated with the varying venom composition. So uh, the fact that the three other species didn't demonstrate the same association between venom composition and physical factors suggests that these associations might be species specific. We just don't know what those associations might be for the other species yet. So they made another connection too. We know that the production of venom and aggressive displays made by cranky funnel webs do have metabolic costs. The team's work suggests that funnel web spices may make behavior trade-offs to compensate for these, increasing their metabolic rate to produce venom and reducing their movements when under threat. Other strategies could involve adjusting the number of bites, modulating venom quantity and making aggressive displays without deploying a venomous bite. The results the researchers say could be helpful for intervenom production and the study of bioactive compounds found in the funnel web venoms. I thought this was really interesting um, that uh, you know the 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 behavior kind of their state uh, at least in in some of these species uh, changed the venom mixture. And uh, it's really interesting how, how this works. So, um, yeah, thank you. No one has a comment. <laughs> That's fine. We can. Oh, no, I'm back in the article. I, I happen to love those spiders because um, their webs are so distinctive. And so I just I had to go back in and read more in the article. <laughs> so I. Yeah, I'm. It's it's amazing. I'm. I'm just sort of thinking about it. Thank you for sharing that. I want to go back in there. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had this researcher here a few months ago that um, showed his work where you know he showed that how spiders kind of have this you know, map of the spider web and where their prey was, how heavy the prey was, that they they have a memory of that and kind of change their behavior. And then also that even their characteristics, like their character traits are um, encoded in their webs. And if you transplant a spider from one web to the other, their character then changes based on the web. So. It's really interesting how spiders use, you know, the tools they produce, like the stuff they produce, how they also use that kind of a, of an expression of what's going on in them. You know, the web kind of structure reflects if they are more aggressive faster or if they're, you know, less, less aggressive. 
and now also the venom kind of reflects what's going on in them so i think that's that's a really interesting um yeah spider characteristic it was it was an amazing room too that it was fascinating the methodology of the research how they how they um you know they determine their findings how they had this how they had set it up and how they were observing it was black widows and i'm i'm wondering also if because they're altering their venom with their mood i i'm i wonder if they alter if there's if there's some way that they're communicating anything or if something can be communicated even as a byproduct of observing the type of web they build um, the funnel web is so distinctive. I'm sure every spider's web is distinctive, but even the black widow's web is distinctive apart from other webs because it's, it's, it, well, it's so shiny and sticky, but, but just that, um, it looks so like it's so irregularly built, but it could be, you know, that there is order in what appears to be chaos and we just don't know how to read the web yet. Yeah, black black widows are are just a trippy concept because they're so shiny and black with that red hourglass. So they're visually, you know, in your face. They're not trying to be discreet by like I'm not here, right? They're like I am here, ten thousand percent. And and the devotion of the males is so absolute. Yeah. We love them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that, Eric, because they're so shy. They're, you know, they're black. That that hourglass is is hard to miss. But you have to see them upside down. Yeah, that's true. True. And, and you know, and they hide. So when I lived in a house that in an area that had a lot of them, then I would, and my kids were small. I they knew how to avoid. You know, we had a rule: you don't put your hands somewhere that your eyes can't go first. So that keeps you safe. But I would go out at night with a flashlight and shine it. And you can see the webs are so shiny in the light. And maybe because they're nocturnal, they're nocturnal hunters, the black widows, then maybe they would be out. But they would run away really quickly. And they're very hard to find in the daytime. You really have to try to get bitten by a black widow. You know, they, they really, <laughs> they try to peacefully coexist with us. <laughs> Or it seems, or it seems. And then there's this super cute little jumping spiders that I have in my greenhouse. They're, they're really, really tiny, like, I don't know, the size of like a, a little bit bigger than like a piece of rice. And they're so cute. They're just really, and they, and they kind of hop around. Um, and, and they're pretty good hunters. I saw one eating a black soldier fly. So <laughs> they're little but fierce. I'm appreciating all the spider love in this room right now. Thank you, Katarina. That was a very interesting article. I want to sort of um, research that further. You know, on the topic of venom, um, baby rattlesnakes are way more poisonous than the adults, is my understanding. Uh, because they can't control their venom output. Uh, when when I was in California, up in the Mojave Desert, uh, we were out in you know out hiking around, and my dog, I had a German Shepherd, uh, went behind a tire, and got bit uh, by a little rattlesnake, and his whole entire face, like um, you know you know, got puffed up. And I, I I had never known that the little guys are actually can be more dangerous than than the bigger dudes. And they have all the same behaviors. They they look just as fierce and they're they're just a miniature version of of a much larger of their much larger self to come. But yes, that's what I've I've read that as well, that that they give it all up at once, all of their venom. And and I don't know, maybe they're not maybe they don't have maybe they lack the muscular control of the of um you know measuring how much venom they need or maybe that since they're tiny they need it all i i don't know the details of that but 
yeah, I've I've seen them. I've I've seen them coiling and shaking when they're tiny, and they're so much harder to see because they're you know they're there in the grass, but um, but again, you can see them. You know, like I think again, like a misunderstood creature like the black widow, people are so afraid of them. But also rattlesnakes, they let you know they're around. You know, they warn us. They hang out in a in a in a warm spot. At least they try to if they're awake. Um, you know, there we have we have a chance to avoid rattlesnake bites with their assistance. So I, I guess you know if you think about the predators that would eat different things, it maybe like rattlesnake venom and spider venom is used to stop to eat, right? It's for slowing down its prey so that it can eat it. Whereas something like a nudibranch in the ocean, they eat coral and put the poisonous coral uh, nematocysts on their gills. And so they're just toxic and they wear it. So, and I guess some butterflies and, you know, so, so different creatures, their toxicity might be a defense or a, you know, an offense in the case of a rattlesnake and a little bit defensive, or in the case of a nudibranch, completely defensive. So just, just riffing on a few concepts about toxicity there. Thank you. Well, Katarina? Yeah, I usually don't do, I was thinking I should do that, but because our guest speaker is also participated, we, we made a book, you know, lately we've been sometimes making a kid's book out of the rooms we make here, like with real research. And uh, so we kind of have our speakers as a character in the book that explains to kids their research, their newest research. And since this is such a cool, neat book, I had to kind of, I usually don't make advertisement, but um, yeah, I will post it in the chat. But um, if you want to check it out, it has like these neat facts um, from his research. So anyway, can I <laughs> interject can here, on. Katarina? It's, it's wonderful whenever you share in any of these books. Katarina has a series now of children's books that explore different topics in science. And as she said, several of them interview a researcher that's spoken here in this room. The books are fantastic. Several of them are translated into Spanish. The illustrations are beautiful and I recommend them. And um, I think it's a great idea to share them in the chat, Katarina, whenever you think of it. And if you don't, I will. Yeah, thank you. But I didn't want people to think I do this room to kind of advertise other stuff that I do, which is not what I wanted to do. So I think another really cool news is two things we can do in everyday life. So I wanted to get to share those. I know we've been going over the time. But I think, you know, really helpful <laughs> news that hopefully, um, yeah, stays as a fact. I don't know, whatever has to do with what we consume, it kind of stays, <clears throat> you know, up to grabs if it will hold over time. But I think lately the studies are getting better and on a larger scale and more scientific human studies. So, yeah, I hope this one uh, stays because I love grapes. <laughs> you know, grapes have had lately a little bit of somewhat of a bad rep because they have so many calories and people say they are too sugary, they have too many calories, especially keto diets and so on tell you to not eat them. Uh, but, you know, they have a lot of great vitamins, antioxidants, you know, for uh, blood flow, they're really good. So um, yeah, this uh, new research uh, from with scientists from Western England, England University and elsewhere investigated the potential of grapes to modulate the human microbiome and influence health. 
and um, the um, the potential influence of the human microbiome consisting of over three million genes and on the order of 10 to the 14 microorganisms on health and well-being is profound says western england university's professor john pezzuto and his colleagues over the past two decades remarkable strides in microbiome research have provided the tools and the knowledge to allow meaningful investigation of the influence of this tissue on human health and disease. Words such as pro prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics, oibiosis and dysbiosis are now commonly incorporated in the ordinary lexicon of the lay public and scientific community. Um, so anyways, you know, there's a huge marketplace for this. And it's an area of interest for us um, as the potential of grapes on health. Dietary consumption is prevalent as reflected by the production of over 6 million tons per year in the U.S. alone. And based on human clinical trials, our studies conducted with animal models, results have suggested an area of responses mediated by the grape on atherosclerosis, inflammation, cancer, gastrointestinal health, CNS defects, osteoarthritis, and ur urinary bladder function and vision. The eight-week study involved um, 29 healthy free-living males and female subjects. The authors analyzed microbiome composition as well as urinary and plasma metabolites in the participants following two weeks of a restricted diet two weeks of then of a restricted diet with grape consumption and four weeks of a restricted diet without grape consumption in total 60 days during the grape consumption consumption phase of the study subject ate two and one fourth cups of grapes per day Changes were seen in the amounts of bacteria detected and in enzyme levels and biological pathways. The analysis of subgroups of subjects showed unique patterns of microbiome distribution. The gut microbiome communicates with all of our organs. We call this the gut organ axis. Our study showed that grapes actively impact the gut microbiome, causing shifts in the intricate interactive networks. And study and thus subtly changing the gut microbiome and the resulting chemicals it produces. Over the years, we have learned that consumption of grapes has grapes has the potential to mediate an amazing cadre of health benefits. The data suggests health improvements in heart, colon, and brain, skin, and more. We now know that grapes can change the chemicals in the microbiome, as these chemicals have access to all of our body organs, it is logical to include, conclude that this leads to some of the health benefits that we have now, that have been established. And this was uh, published in the Journal of Scientific Reports, which I think is a pretty good journal. So, yeah, I think <laughs> we shouldn't delete grapes out of our um, diet and the I don't think it can hurt to eat grapes as long as they are not too much full of pesticides, I think. <laughs> yeah, totally. Just, yeah, definitely want to be careful that you're eating grapes that haven't been sprayed, but, but they're so, they're full of pectin, which is fantastic for cleaning out our vascular system, for one thing. They're full of water which is great for hydrating us, but then also all the studies showing the importance of resveratrol. And that's something that, that can be ingested from, it's from the skin. Um, it's something that grapes, the plant uses um, itself to help fight off fungus, but that has anti-tumor, anti-cancer, you know, anti antioxidant qualities. It's, it's such a rich, it's grapes are, are like a treasure fruit and they're, they're beautiful and they're fun to eat and you can freeze them <laughs> and you can peel them. They're, they're wonderful to eat. I, I yeah, never stop eating them. Thank you for what, that what article. About, what about wine? Oh yeah, that too. Does it count? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, good. My, my my wife has this little thing on the refrigerator says so she loves the different wine regions of our house. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. Um, that's interesting. I was waiting for the mention of, of resveratrol in that article. Um, and I'm, yeah, I have to go back into it then again, too. To what were they, were they mentioning um, specific chemical compounds in the grape? And was it the, the skin as well as the flesh? Um, uh, sorry, my son did something in the backyard. Oh, I hope it's okay. <laughs> okay, any other comments while we take care of the son in the backyard? I, I'll, I'll just say out here in the San Francisco area, believe it or not, at the Korean stores, at all the Asian markets, they have these giant grapes called Kyoho's, which are like a hybrid of Concord. And they're just insanely good, but I've been I, I got into Slipskins um, grapes a long time ago, Concords and everything, and those are just delightful. So, <laughs> but but of course, to get enough with Veritrol, you've got to drink what seventy gallons of wine a day. Well, enough for what you know? I mean, I I feel like I, I mean the question. <laughs> no, I mean the amount. I guess I'm referring to the amount they were giving the mice that were tested oh, okay. on the resveratrol relative to their weight. I mean, it's all somewhat speculative. Um, I'm a, I, I have been taking resveratrol for pro about 12 years since I ran into Ray Kurzweil and started learning about um, de-aging or age slowing, uh, you know, a supplementation. I mean, he's all over it and I've been following him for a while. So, yeah. Resveratrol is is got a is very exciting technology, but you've got to have other stuff with it, from what I understand, to make it work. Uh, NMN is also something I take. Uh, that's what I'm into. You can folks see it in the list of articles that I I put in the chat. You can see everything I'm taking. I'm giving the information away. Twenty five years of research. Uh, just look in my list of articles I published. If you're interested, maybe you're not interested. <laughs> So that's okay too. In any case, thank you. It's Richard. Yeah, well, we thank you, Richard. We just want to make sure that that um, people don't um, that they understand as a disclaimer that we are not giving medical advice in this room. That we are not physicians. Um, that we are not definitely not giving medical advice. We are sharing information and and discussing it as we see interest. As far as resveratrol and eating grapes, I would say that you know, everything in moderation, eat these gifts that come from the earth and, and eat them as far as your, um, you know, your varied diet. And, and that's really what I think we're talking about here, not anything like mega dosing grapes to get, uh, I know that, that there is that, that, um, you know, studies of, uh, you know, that you're mentioning, but I think here we're just, examining these beneficial reasons to enjoy eating grapes and and enjoy you know really nature's bounty so maybe the uh, the reason you eat them is because you love them <laughs> it, feel, it feels it's a wonderful thing to eat and they're beautiful and eric you mentioned concord grapes and those are the, those are just so full of flavor i love those i love um, making jam with them even if you just make one little jar of it, it's just such a big, beautiful mess. And the color is incredible. And you just reminded me also of grape leaves. I don't know if anybody's ever made dolmas, but those grape leaves are really good on the Concord grape. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that earlier. <laughs> My son hurt himself a little bit. Anyways, um, the... Um, yeah, I agree. You should also just eat what you love eating, and especially if it comes like right from nature, basically. Um, we used to have grapes in Portugal, like grow them uh, in the patio, and they were so good. Um, 
but I looked into the paper. They basically, in this study, I think they did studies before, um, many other studies, but in this study, they looked at, you know, the gut microbiome diversity and then the metabolites they kind of excrete. And then, then also they looked for those in plasma and in urine from people. They analyzed that. So they didn't look into kind of other compounds of the grapes and what they do. They focus really on the microbiome here. But there's for sure if you look into what else these authors published um, by John Pizzuto, uh, there's for sure other related papers that go more into, you know, other compounds of grapes and um, stuff and, and what the health benefits are. Yeah, and then I thought another positive uh, study that hopefully, I don't know if it will make it <laughs> to being actually used, we never know, but I think it's encouraging to read about it, um, which is more climate change related and technologies how to basically you know have more cleaner renewable energy so this new innovative system can turn seawater into fuel and um, this was done by the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory Stanford University and University of Oregon and the cocktail of elements in seawater, including hydrogen, oxygen, sodium, and others, is essential for life on Earth. However, this intricate chemical makeup poses a challenge when attempting to separate um, hydrogen gas from sustainable energy applications. Recently, this team of scientists um, has discovered a method to extract the hydrogen from the ocean. They accomplished this by funneling seawater through a double membrane system and electricity. The innovative design proved successful in generating hydrogen gas without producing large amounts of harmful byproducts. The results of their study recently published in journal JUU could help advance efforts to produce low carbon fuels. Many water to hydrogen systems today try to use a monolayer of single layer membrane. Our study brought two layers together, said Adam Nylander, an associated staff scientist with the Sunket Center for Interface Science and Catalyst at SLAC Stanford Joint Institute. These membrane architectures allow us to control the way ions <coughs> in seawater moved in our experiment. Hydrogen gas is a low carbon fuel currently used in many ways, such as to run fuel cell, electricity vehicles, and as long duration energy storage options. One that is suited to store energy for weeks, months, or longer for electric grids. Many attempts to make hydrogen gas with fresh or desalinated water, but those methods can be extensive and uh, energy intensive. Treated water is easier to work with because it has less stuff floating around. However, purifying water is expensive, requires energy and adds complexity to devices. Another option, natural fresh water, also contains a number of impurities that are problematic for modern technology, in addition to being a more limited resource on the planet. To work with seawater, the team implemented a bipolar or two-layer membrane system and tested it using electrolysis, a method that uses electricity to drive irons or charge elements to run a desired reaction. They started their design by controlling the most harmful element to the seawater system, chloride. Um, there are many reactive species in seawater that can interfere with the water to hydrogen reaction and the sodium chloride that makes seawater salty is one of the main culprits. In particularly, chloride that gets to the anode and oxidizes will reduce the lifetime of an electrolysis system and can actually become unsafe due to the toxic nature of the oxidation products that include molecular chlorine and bleach. The bipolar membrane in the experiment allows access to the conditions needed to make a hydrogen gas and mitigates chloride from getting to the reaction center. We are essentially doubling up on ways to stop this chloride reaction. 
a home for hydrogen. The ideal membrane system would perform three primary functions, separate hydrogen and oxygen gases from seawater, help move only the useful hydrogen and hydroxide ions while restricting other seawater ions, and help prevent undesirable reactions. Capturing all three of these together is hard, and the team's research is targeted toward exploring systems that can effectively uh, combine all three of these needs. Specifically, in their experiment, protons were, <coughs> which were the positive hydrogen ions pass through one of the membrane layers to a place where they can be collected and turned into a hydrogen gas by interacting with a negatively charged electrode. The second membrane in the system allows own negative ions such as chloride to travel through. As an additional backstop, one membrane layer contains negatively charged groups that are fixed to the membrane, which makes it harder for other negatively charged ions like chlorides to move to places where they shouldn't be. Um, the negatively charged membrane proves to be highly efficient in blocking almost all of the chloride ions in the team's experiments, and their system operated without generating toxic byproducts like bleach and chlorine. Along with designing a seawater to hydrogen membrane system, the study also provides a better general understanding of how seawater ions move through membranes. This knowledge can help scientists design stronger membranes for other applications as well as such producing oxygen gas. There's also some interest in using electrolysis to produce oxygen. Understanding ion flow and conversion in our bipolar membrane system is critical for this effort too. Along with producing hydrogen in our experiment, we also showed how to use the bipolar membrane to generate oxygen gas. Next, the team plans to improve their electrodes and membranes by building them with materials that are more abundant and easily mined. This design improvement could make the electrolysis system easier to scale to a size needed to generate hydrogen for energy intensive activities like the transportation sector the team said. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. <laughs> I didn't know how toxic the byproducts would be by separating. Like before I read this article, I didn't know about this problem <laughs> even. Um, why people don't use seawater more for this and then also how they learned about, you know, how we could also produce oxygen in the future. And I hope they, they get this to work with cheaper, more abundant resources. And then hopefully it gets adopted <laughs> by industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, for one thing, um, hello to your little doggy <laughs> in the background. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just thinking about the um, flammable, you know, the how safe that is. How are they storing the hydrogen? in the presence of of these electrodes that are being used to to separate the gases and also um is that a mention that they hope to build this this mechanism with materials that are more abundant and easily mined yeah i guess that's that's something for the future so yeah, this is really very interesting and very exciting and makes me wonder also how many how many um, systems there are that have been developed to to separate the gases um, using seawater. But I see this one is different because it has this double membrane, but this is this is amazing. Yeah, so I think the idea at least, you know, um, for example, in Germany, um, they switched off their nuclear reactors and they want to move more and more to renewables. And um, the nuclear reactors and now the coal and gas, they kind of provide the steady state of electricity production without the need for a lot of uh, large-scale batteries and their idea is to basically when you 
the times you produce more energy than you consume uh, to feed that into this hydrogen production and kind of have that then as a battery, this hydrogen. And then when you need it, then use the hydrogen as a fuel to produce electricity, basically. But the, the, right. less, okay, yeah, the less sweet water we can use, the better, because, yeah, this will be, a sweet water will be a resource that is, you know, getting more and more limited, even in places like France and so on. There were droughts this year, so, and uh, lakes around the world are shrinking and so on. So I think, yeah, using seawater would be really wonderful. Right. And then you'd have on-site cooling as well. It will be, um, I think it would be good to maintain a chart of this research that we're finding of an organized by topic and then follow it and see what happens after six months see who gets funded, you know, see who's, who's, um, whose process is being implemented and where. Because we've really read a lot of, of promising research here. There, you know, we know that. We know that, that the technology exists. It's really about the funding and who is, um, you know, what kind of powers that be are working against these these clean energies so i'm i'm interested in this thank you for sharing this article well that's an interesting point you're making because we had the guest speaker here that talked about this really interesting developments and you know uh the clean energies and and we actually discussed this with various um researchers that you know, for example, develop um, uh, compounds for antibiotic resistant, you know, uh, bacteria to fight them. And they, what they say is, there's not necessarily for these issues, the problem to get funding to do the research. The problem that they have is that then nobody takes it and adapts that that the industry doesn't take all of this new developments and produce them. For example, for antibiotic resistant, the big reason is that the general, like the regular antibiotics we have, are just very, very cheap to produce. And there's relatively few people for the industry that would need these more expensive products. So for them, it doesn't make any sense. It wouldn't be profitable to produce these um, because they're not a, there wouldn't be enough people for the insurances to pay for this more expensive product. Um, so there should be and then the same thing is for all these different new technologies for, you know, batteries, renewable energies, and so on. The thing is, there should be also go, uh, there should be also money going into, you know, startup companies or for companies to take these technologies and scale them, and so that they can get cheaper and accessible for consumers or insurances to pay, you know, new drugs. So there is a lack of funding there. So, but nobody is really addressing and discussing this on a large scale. Like there's a lot of NIH funding, NSF funding and so on, but then the step in between that, you know, this will be turned into a product, they, there's not much. And also a lot of companies are actually not aware of all these developments, you know. There's really, they don't pay somebody to do the job we're doing, to scroll through all this research and, and then see what's out there, you know. They don't have that as a job. 
and they said we should do it that's what they said they said you should go with your this organization and tell companies what they should adopt and we probably the universities or they if they have the patents they would give them out for free they just want their work to be used you know by humanity so yeah we've heard that in here as well there have been researchers in here who have who have said exactly yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, <laughs> that's our speakers. Mm -hmm. have said that. Yeah, yeah, we want to share information, and um, yeah, it reminds me of I don't know if you know that that movie, Who Killed the Electric Car. the The director was is has was here for ages in Clubhouse, Chris Payne, and it was a movie about um, EVs in the US and how General Motor had developed them in the mid 1990s and then talks about how how the government limited the development and adoption of the technology and you know essentially killed it because it it was it was it was there you know it was a GM GM was developing it and did have funding for that and then people worked against it to kill it but um yeah, maybe we keep this little record and then we, we uh, do some traveling and inform people what we know. There's all this great technology and we know about it. Yeah, it would be interesting. You would basically have to go through what companies do and then match them. Basically a matchmaking between that. I have a suspicion that there will be an AI for that very soon. <laughs> yeah, still somebody has to connect that AI to the place, or I guess somebody needs to be using that intelligence for their, you know, for those purposes. But right, yeah. So this this database. Well, thank you. This is an encouraging article. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. We went from all kinds of insects, slime mold, mushrooms, uh, human health, uh, brain surgery, you know, these very tiny, small, invasive brain interventions and microbiome to uh, turn seawater into fuel. So I think we covered a lot. And this was so much fun also to learn about um what some of our listeners eric um for example you are still here <laughs> uh, what hobbies you have and what you are interested in that was also really uh, nice to hear um so yeah i encourage everyone to participate in the discussion and share something because then we get to know you too and that's a lot of fun for us too. So yeah, thank you for sharing and coming and come again. And yeah, as I said earlier, we'll have tomorrow a speaker coming at 1 p.m. EST from the UK, Dr. T. Roller. Um, and he will talk about his double slit experiment, but on time and how that worked out. Uh, I think it will be really interesting. We already had the previous speaker that talked about time and memory that he really wants to come tomorrow too. I think that will be also an interesting discussion uh, between those two scientists to listen to. So yeah, feel free to come and uh, I hope to hear you all again soon. Thank you very much everyone for being here. Really appreciate all of your presence. Thank you, it was a fun. Good times, good times. It was fun. Thank you. We look forward to more. Yep, I agree. It was a lot of fun. Okay, I'll close the room. And three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you.